So I would, I would love to bring it back to one moment because I know there's like a lot of right here. So we got going. I know Risha couldn't think you were going to say, so here's the thing. Yes. Well, no, I was going to say the way that the, so do you want me to go? No, go for it. Okay. <laughs> Just the way that the language of hate was mobilized in this election. Huh? Oh. Oh, yeah. Just the way the, the language of hate was mobilized in this election. Because, like, is it jobs or is it racism? Yeah. We don't have jobs in this country. And the people that voted for Trump think the reason they don't have jobs is because of immigrants, yes. Muslims, <coughs> black people, Mexicans, you know, stupid women or something. Right? They're and people. somebody threw the jobs over. Oh, okay. And that's the lie. Yes. The lie yes. is that yes. this man, Donald Trump, his economic policies are not going to bring the jobs that the voters expect him to bring. And it's not the fault of minorities and immigrants that we don't have jobs. No. And it's even women and people of color who voted for Trump who think that it's their own people's fault, perhaps, that they don't have jobs. I, I mean, there are so many contradictions. You know, there were, I, I feel like he was able to use this language of hate to tap into people's fears yes. mm -hmm. of being poor, of being alone, of being homeless, of not right. having benefits, of not having anything. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for a logic. Why am I in this situation? Oh, it's because the Democrats haven't done anything for me. They've been saying they're trying to bring jobs. I can't get a high-tech job. I can't even get into college. There's not going to be a high-tech industry. I need an industrial or I need a vocational job. I need somebody who's going to bring that to me. Donald Trump is something new. He has no economic agenda. He has no plan for bringing jobs. He just has a promise, and he's different. He mm -hmm. says, the reason you're in this position is because of these immigrants and because of all this. And people are looking. Maybe that is the reason. And he's not going to be able to deliver. And the margins of poverty and inequality are going to rise. Yes. And so this kind of a conversation, you know, working class people, in this country have to know that we are so much better off if we align ourselves with the anti-racist movement, the yes. anti-sexist movement, the LGBTQ movement, the anti-war movement, because there's a bourgeois interest in this as well. The alt-right is pushing this ideology because it's the only way they can exploit the labor of the working class. Get them to join the military, go get some rich Arab countries or rich oil rich countries, and feel like they're doing it to protect their country, you know? And what other option do they have? They can't get a job at home. What other opportunity do they have? It's 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 incredibly <laughs> profoundly sad. Yeah. I see so, over here and then I see saw Delma's hand. Yeah. So my name is Bob, and so as you were talking. Uh, I started thinking about uh, our very first speaker that we had after Tim Wise came in, and that was uh, Ruben Martinez, and he talked about neoliberalism and how this 50-year journey of the language of hate without using any hateful words right. has convinced white working class that the enemy is everybody you just said. Yes. And, and that is a language of hate that is so insidious because there's no inflammatory words that were used around making that transition. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they were there, but you know, the, the, the general pattern, the, 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 the great, um, how that divide ever happened mm -hmm. where working class white people suddenly thought, oh, the enemy is not those who are really oppressing me, but they are my fellow oppressed people. Right. And that's an amazing journey of a journey of the Well, and don't those people. messages come from above? Yes. Management saying, or, or wealthy people who have an economic stake in whatever the workers are doing, saying threats are coming from yes. your yeah. economic status, not from us. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. the unions used to help with that. Yeah. Some yeah. So I was just remarking on the the language of hate. You know, it doesn't have to be 
the uh, shouting, the screaming, the right. yelling, the burning of the cross, to have such a fundamental um, divide happen. Mm -hmm. The language of hate can actually be very soft, like so extremely powerful. Yeah. I saw, saw Del Delma and, and you, sir, and put the plate shirt on, and then Charles at the end. <laughs> and then somehow I had to, you know, to find a way to bring it together. Yeah. Well, I think to give the folks who have, I know Chuck has had an opportunity to talk about it, so I can bring
know, this kind of thing, you're, 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 we're trying to make, I write too, but not for, for a living, I, I go broke, but I write to try and make sense of this stuff. But in order to do that, you gotta be able to think, you gotta be able to research, yeah. and most of all in this culture, you've gotta be able to take some quiet time and let this stuff reflect and review and all of that. You know, going like this all the time and not yes. getting it, you know, we're not, we're, we're, we're diverging a long way away from our human connections, first of all. So, my point is, I guess we just got to keep deconstructing these words, like <coughs> neoliberalism, and, uh, and, and, and this isn't just an ism. Dr. Dr. Curry, you in fact had something on your part about ism, so I would love to have your input on this, but liberal with neoliberalism is what's running the show here. Money is the god. And that's the, that's the bottom line in all this. That's some tough stuff to be up against. This is a great way to start, I think. But I also think we got to get the kids educated. we got to get, you know, we've got to Yeah, yeah. But, for example, your mom took you to the library. My mom took me to the library. It was easy, piece of cake. Nobody's going to the library that much, I mean, except this library. Maybe. Yeah. But, um, so I guess my point is, this is, this is back up to this young man's down here, which is the intentionality of language is important, but so is the definition of the words. And uh, when they start swinging around neoliberalism, I think they ought to be each time said, hey, look, this is what this means, you know. But if you don't have a population that understands that, or understands that we are a racist society, the white race should have a lot of shit coming down on it right now because this country started on Genocide and, and slavery. Yes, There's no way to get around that America greatness stuff. Oh, you know? it, it's yeah. as I said to some friends of me recently. With, uh, she's Nancy. As, I'm Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Being a white person, you're, we're just as indoctrinated in racism as every black person in this room, every person of any color. And for me, it's it's this gilded cage. Well, yeah, I woke up one day and I saw the gilded cage. But most people don't see that gilded cage. They don't know how cushy that environment is. And they don't know it's a trap. They don't know that they're just as trapped as everybody else and trying to bring them to the realization that they are living in this gilded cage is, is really, really tough because they don't want to believe they're in <coughs> They don't want to believe They don't also don't want to be part of the thing. They want that they're part of that hate. Yeah. They don't want to own up to it. Yeah. Exactly. You don't, you, know, you don't wake up in the morning and go, okay, I'm living in a trap. And you don't, you don't want to know that you're surrounded by that. So it's it's the realization for most white people that you wake up one day and you go, I am trapped. And you gotta wake up every day and tell yourself, okay, if you want out of this trap, you have to tell yourself you're a racist and you have to stop that. And it's it's an uphill battle. Mm -hmm. It's an uphill battle for anybody who is uh, especially on the cushy end of things, because because privilege is everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, you're surrounded. To you touch on your point of definition, we're taught, at least in my generation, we were, that racism can be across the board by the definition in the book. Mm -hmm. That we can experience that no matter what color we are. Mm -hmm. When that's not true. For us in the white society in America, we can experience prejudice, but we hold the power. We are the ones at the top of the chain here. So the whole construct of the definition of the, the, the word racism, it teaches you that any can be racist towards you. And that's another thing that you have to battle with a lot of the stuff that's going on. White people are sure that if a black song person says something or, or whatever color, well, that's racist. When, no, it could be prejudiced, or it could just be the truth that you're being that racist <laughs> um, So yeah, I mean, there, there will be definitions that were written by white men that will uphold that teaching and that ideology. My first uh, awareness of that was when I 